have a question, raise your hand, we'll bring a mic to you. Go ahead, Rich. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Doing great. Um, can you uh, evaluate the job that Nick Singleton has done as a kickoff returner? Uh, I know he had a little, you know, mid-season um, issue, but then came back and I was just wondering what your overall evaluation of, of him is. Well, he's, he's trended, you know, exactly the way you want a, a freshman in that situation to trend. You know, Nick's an elite talent. You certainly see it from from his ability at a running back, and we worked hard through the, the kick return standpoint to get that. We had a couple shots early. You know, he was a couple just real close, just like anything in kick return. It's a timing and spacing play. Uh, Auburn, he was really inches away from taking one, had had space. We saw it multiple times. And so it was great in that Rutgers game to give him the time and space. And, and a lot of that's not Nick. That's making sure that we give him the ability to get that space that he needs because he's electric when he's in space, and, and I couldn't be more fired up to continue to watch him grow and develop. Hey, Stacey. Um, I wanted to ask about some of your younger specialists, Alex Paquetta and Sandra Sahadak. Where are both of them at kind of in their development? Yeah, they both developed well. You know, Sandra's, you know, a year, year longer in the program, um, elite leg strength. Uh, it was great. You know, we were able to get a lot of those specialists true game time. And that's unique. You don't, you don't get a chance to do that a lot. So the way some of the games were able to work out, we're able to get them in games, get them live reps. Um, so Sanders continued to develop um, as a field goal guy and also as a kickoff player. A lot of that's behind the scenes that we see in practice. But to actually get them out in the stadium, uh, get them out in, in live reps was, was important. And the same thing with Alex, you know, to be able to get some live punts. And, you know, you can take as many punts as you want. And you can do it against the scout team. But to actually get game reps, I thought was extremely important. So we're excited about where both those guys are trending. Stacy P- Penninger had really kind of an up and down year. Started a little slow, then was really great for a long time, and then a slower finish. So, what does he what does he do during this few weeks period here, leading into a bowl game where, quite frankly, it's, it's kind of a pick 'em game. It could come down to him. So, what does he have to do to get over that slow finish? Yeah, with Jake, you know, he does a great job of bouncing back. You know, certainly he was on a, he was he was on fire. You know, he was in the streak we won, hitting long field goals, missed a couple late, and those are the things that. Nobody wants wants to happen, but with him, he he will bounce back. It's a couple technical things that are pretty minor, but the, but they're major when you're missing field goals. So we've got to find a way to get that cleaned up, and we will. And Jake will. What you do now is you work through the bowl. It's really like a training camp setting. For him initially, he being a kid who's you know, kicked so long, we rested him here a little bit the last few weeks, so we've kept it pretty light. And now we'll start ramping that back up into game mode and our normal weekly transition. But I'll tell you what, this I, I got the utmost confidence in Jake Pinniger. I know he'll bounce back. Um, we'll get him back in in the rhythm that he's been in. And, and he's been awesome to work with. Just with the delay for a bowl game, how important is special teams in games like this, just like the first game of the season? How would you assess just the importance of how special teams uh, play in, in a bowl game? Yeah, I certainly think you look at like the first game of the season where you're getting time and getting space. Those are, you know, when I say time and space, you know, that's where the hidden yardage comes from. So uh, I treat it a lot like that first game of the season as you're going through camp, making sure that you have a routine and development to continue to uh, you get your fundamentals and techniques where you want them, develop young players. But as we progress closer and closer to the game, getting our core group of guys ready to go, ready to play with speed and space. And so it is a huge part. And you'll see it as these bowl games start today. You're going to see the teams that have done a really good job of working that speed and space, the tackling aspect of it that certainly fits from a special team standpoint, and finding ways to, to get that hidden yardage to set your offense and defense up and put points on the board and with the opportunity to put points on the board. Stacy, what did it mean to you and the team to see Chris Stoll win that national award? And can you uh, give us an indication of some of the guys who might be uh, in line to handle that job next year. I think he's, he's through his 15 years of eligibility now, and, and you might have to look for someone else. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, just an awesome award and so well-deserving for Chris. You know, I can't say enough you know, good things about him as a person, as a player, his work ethic, and he put it on tape. I think one of the cool things about the Manly Award is they actually take every, every game from the season, evaluate it, and work that. So different than some other awards where maybe they're based off of statistic analysis. This is actually, hey, how does this guy snap? How does this guy block? To me, that's that's the, that's the greatest compliment you can get when you're, you're getting a group of people that are watching every snap that you played this year and say you're the best in the nation. So couldn't be more happy for Chris and, and definitely deserving. Oh, yeah. So, you know, guys, so, uh, you know, Tyler Duzangsi got some, some reps this year. He's been in the program now. This is his second year. Uh, Tyler's done a great job. And then we have the two young freshmen that have shown a lot of promise with uh, Will Patton and Blaze Sokatch Minnick. And so those guys are getting a ton of reps now as we work through uh, these last couple of weeks of practice as we continue to go. Uh, we'll get Chris, you know, he, he's got some reps. We'll continue to work him through. But I'm excited where that long snapper position is um, and excited to watch these guys compete as we go through spring. 
Uh, Stacy, uh, we were talking to uh, Jonathan Sutherland uh, over here. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were talking to Jonathan Sutherland uh, late in the season, talking about other players he'd seen behind the scenes in that special teams unit. You mentioned Tyler Warren uh, a couple times as, as someone that really impressed him with that unit. What does Tyler do? But you know, behind the scenes, what you know, what kind of role does he have there that you know would get someone like Sutherland's attention there? Well, very similar to Sutherland, just how he approaches every practice and every rep. Extremely consistent, uh, knows exactly what's going on from a schematic standpoint, physical. Uh, you can make quick adjustments, he adjusts to it. He plays plays and practices at an elite level. So, I, you know, him and John are very, very similar in their approach, their work to the game, and it's great to be around those guys. Tyler, uh, Stacy, if I could tap into your assistant linebacker kind of coach mentality real quick. A couple of freshmen that you got a long look at on the practice field, Keon Wiley, and of course, Abdul Carter, who we've seen a lot of. Can you discuss maybe how those guys have grown since their earliest reps back in August to where they are finishing their freshman seasons? Yeah, you know, Abdul's had an unbelievable freshman year. You've seen him, and he's taken a lot of reps, so he's able to you know, continue to grow and develop and, and excited to see where, you know, not only where he's at now, but as he continues to go. And I think that, you know, sky's the limit for, for Abdul. Now you got to keep grinding, you need to keep working, but he's been a pleasure to be around, be in the room with. Uh, Keon has made a ton of development here in the last part of the season. You know, he was hurt early in camp, and that's always hard for a freshman when you get hurt early in camp because that's a great opportunity to get a ton of the refs actually in our scheme, a ton of development. So I give him credit of bouncing back after you know some injury time to be able to get better and better and better and he's really flashed this last month you've really seen his body's change you can see what he's doing in the weight room he's long he's physical he can run I get a chance to work with him a lot on special teams also he's the type of body type that we want so excited to where where you know the direction that Ken's going Stacy along the lines of uh, Tyler can you talk about the success that Dom has had and what he brings to the table special teams wise yeah, Dom's been awesome. I mean, if you look what he's done, uh, uh, you know, just consistently, I think a lot of people don't get a chance to see it. He's been elite running down on our kickoff units. I mean, elite. And at he, the opening kickoff, Michigan State, he splits a double, makes a tackle inside, I believe, the 20 at the time. A uh, workmanlike dude. I mean, he, he, you know, and again, I get the opportunity to be in the room with him also, but I can't say enough good things about Dom DeLuke, and, and he certainly fits in that role with Ty as leaders on the team. And I'd add Malik Mega to that also. And you look at the amount of reps they've played on special teams, the production he's played, especially from our coverage units from a punt, uh, kickoff standpoint. Uh, he's blocked a punt for us this year, uh, Dom has, and, and it's been great. And, you know, Malik's another guy that I got to bring up in that conversation because those three guys have been, are, are trending exactly where we want them to be. I shouldn't say trending, they've, they've put it on, on tape. Um, the amount of reps that Malik's played, he's been a force coming down as a bullet on punt. On our kickoff coverage, his speed down the middle of the field has disrupted a lot of people. We got time for one more, Audrey. Stacy, um, your punt return unit, how would you assess that it's done this year? And then obviously, what do you think the future of that unit can hold, obviously without Parker, but then eventually without Tinsley as well? Yeah, we gotta, we got to be more consistent with our return game. I, I would say that, you know, um, um, had success in that unit at other places. And what we've got to do is do a better job of being able to push the ball vertical and get space and really work to create and get that first first down and, and get more positive yardage from a return standpoint. We've had multiple chances to block punts. We got one. That's a little frustrating. We've, we've just came flat free on a, on a couple. Missed one early in that Michigan State game. That gives you a chance on that first punt to really you know flip the momentum. So those are things we'll continue to work on. Um, I like where we're at from a fundamental and technique standpoint of how we're holding up and we're doing certain things. But we've got to continue to, to develop in the return game. Yeah, absolutely. So that'll be, you know, as you as you lose a Parker, as you lose a Tinsley, is, you know, develop, finding that punt returner, who's going to be the guy that we can get to be consistent to push the ball vertical and get us positive yards. All right. Thank you, Stacey. Yep. Appreciate it. That in front. Good. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, coach, how do you plan on splitting up the bowl reps this, or I'm sorry, the quarterback reps here during bowl practices and in the lead up to the game, knowing this is Sean's last opportunity, but also knowing that these are valuable opportunities to develop the two guys behind him? Yeah, no question. Um, this is a great opportunity for the young guys to get more reps, but as we get closer and closer to, you know, really trying to get, uh, you know, the Utah game plan going, it's going to be a lot like it was in the, in the middle of the season, throughout the season where Sean gets majority of the reps with the ones. There'll be some opportunity um, for Drew to get some reps with the ones as well, but we, we've got to get Sean ready to go, so it'll be a lot like in season. Over on this side, uh, now that you've had some time to, well, I guess you haven't had time to step back as you were out recruiting, but could you give your general thoughts on what Sean's season was like uh, to you, and where do you see his future uh, playing quarterback? Do you think he 
projects to that next level, and how, how might he fit in there? Thanks. Yeah, his season, I'll tell you, he, he did a lot of great things, Sean did for us, um, from a toughness standpoint, um, from a leadership standpoint. And, um, you know, he, he played very well consistently throughout the year. Um, so we were happy to see that and took care of the ball very well, made some big time plays. Um, you know, Sean, I think his, his, uh, his future is bright. Um, I think he's one of those guys that's going to continue to work hard and be very dependable for whatever organization picks him up or drafts him. Um, so I think he's got a bright future as, as far as that goes. Um, he's very accurate with the football, and he's going to continue to learn. And one thing's for sure, he's going to compete his butt off. So he's going to be uh, an interesting guy to follow and, and see where he lands and, and watch his future. Rich. Mike. How would you describe the seasons that Katron and Nick had, and how would you describe their maturity level? You know, we thought they were really good coming in. We were very happy uh, when we signed them and knew that our future was bright, and they continued to develop throughout the year. And I think the thing that really stands out um, is how Coach Sider, his plan, and how he's brought that room along and how they're able to complement one another um, and also uh, compete against each other, so to speak, but be really good teammates to one another. They push one another, but they pick each other up too. They got each other's backs. And that's been the biggest key to the whole thing, um, is them being unselfish and playing their butts off for them, uh, for each other. And, uh, you know, their attitudes and, and uh, their ability to do all things, they've got good strength. You've got to credit their high school programs for how far along they are. And uh, those guys have been, have been top notch and, and have gradually gotten better throughout the season. Well? Extremely good. You know, they are very mature guys. They're, they're both, none of them, neither of them are, are, are very talkative guys, um, but they have good leadership skills that we have to continue to develop and they, and they have to become more vocal for us. They're our best players and they got to continue to step up with that, but that's got to be a natural process and that will happen. Um, but those guys, you know, they, right now they're, they lead by example. They play extremely tough and physical and, uh, they're, they're great teammates. Like I said, Audrey. Thank you. Sorry, you guys were able to get Drew a lot of reps in games uh, this year. How would you evaluate kind of how that process went of getting him in games? And also, what are you kind of focusing on now with him in terms of his next steps with his development? So the process goes that you want to win the football game. So like that's our goal, right, to win the game. And then when you feel that you have a comfortable enough lead, um, and in Purdue it was, you know, um, it was, uh, you know, a situation where he had to go in, you know. So, um, you know, we felt throughout the season that when we felt comfortable enough putting him in the game, um, the earlier the better at times. Uh, maybe some guys would have stuck with their starter a little bit longer uh, based on, on the score. And, and uh, when your defense is playing as well if we, as we played throughout the season, we felt pretty confident putting him in when we did uh, to secure the game, but also to give him – reps that matter you know so i you know right now where he's at uh he's really come along very well and we're just continuing to, to just press on the the little things the the things that are you know uh controllable in the in the film room of identifications uh continuing to press on the protections and and the, the basics of, of quarterback play and to test um, and to see the things that he doesn't know or doesn't understand and try to find that threshold and continue to push on those things. But he's pretty well versed in everything. I'll tell you, he's come a long ways, um, as has Bo, and uh, extremely happy about both of those guys' progress thus far. Court. Mike, your wide receiver situation, Parker going to the NFL, Mitch will be gone. Um, what's the confidence level like with the younger guys that you have in the program and maybe the balance of might you need to go get somebody that is going to be proven? Uh, do you have a number one or number two already in the program, and do you have to go feel like you maybe have to go get one? I think those guys are uh, the, the younger receivers right now. I think um, 
we still have to we still have to develop those guys, but yet you see things in practice and and some things in games where they're promising without question. The ability's there, the talent's there. Um, we just have to continue to get them reps. They're young players um, that have to, to really focus on the details and the fundamentals of the game and the, the fundamentals of this offense from a scheme standpoint. And they need to continue to press on. And, and uh, But we like our room right now. Um, is there room to supplement? Um, yes, there is. And we're looking into that right now as, as uh, far as recruiting goes and, and looking into improving the room any way we can, whether it be high school and, and portal. Right here, John. Mike, uh, obviously Olu and Hunter have already announced that they're returning next year. How important is the return of those guys, and how has the improvement along the offensive line kind of opened up the menu for you? When Say it comes the first to part again, please. I'm sorry. Uh, Olu and, and Hunter and Morzat have both said that they're coming back next year. Yeah. How important are their returns, and, and how uh, has the impressiveness of the offensive line opened up the menu? When yeah, it comes to like extremely calling? happy you know, to hear the news that they're both returning. It gives us a lot of stability up front. It gives us a lot of toughness up front coming back. Um, great leadership. And I think it speaks volumes to the culture that we have. I think it speaks a lot to Coach how, how Coach Troutwine is, is uh, you know, how he grooms that room and, and the relationships in that room. I think all of that speaks to the culture of our program and, and to, to what Trout's done um, and how they respect him and how much they care for this program. I think it's extremely important. Um, that they do return, obviously, for the, for the betterment of the offensive line and the offense, but that room has continued to get tougher and more physical each and every week and, and just a gradual improvement, and we need to continue on that, on that trend. Well, you strive for balance as a play caller, and you, you strive to um, make sure that you're, you're scoring as many points as you possibly can at the end of the day, whether it's run game or pass game. And the better that you run it, the better that you can pass it, and, and vice versa at times. Sometimes you have to start with the pass to open up the run. So having the ability to do both, obviously you have to pass protect. Um, obviously you want to try to get the tight ends involved in the pass game as well. And, and a lot of times when you're releasing tight ends on free releases, you're not able to, to chip and to help your tackles and to have an experienced group and a, and a group that um, is able to sustain their one-on-one -on -one blocks on the perimeter. It allows you to free up your tight ends and your receivers down the field. So all of those things factor in and, and very important for the overall success of the offense. Time for a few more. We'll go Mike, Bob, and Ben. Over here, Mike. Mike. You have, you're in the unique position that you recently worked for the same head coach and of a, of a team that may be your biggest rival. What does Penn State have to do, having lost to Ohio State and Michigan, to get in their position as far as top four in the college playoffs? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think what we need to do is make sure that uh, we're executing better and that we're coaching better. Um, I think all of those things, um, add up. Um, I don't think it's one thing necessarily. That's a, that's a very um, complex question that a lot of things factor into it. I think we need to continue to recruit at a, at a championship level. And, um, you know, it starts with that. But at the end of the day, we have to continue to take care of the ball and finish and control what we can control. So I think our guys are hungry, and, and I don't want to really look past this Rose Bowl and that sort of thing with this question. It's difficult for me to answer at this time. Um, but, you know, I think those things all add up. I don't think it's one thing, and, and we're going to continue to press on and, and drive that home. Mike, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I wanted to ask you about Drew Shelton. He had a pretty big role for you guys at left tackle when Olu uh, couldn't play in November. What did you see from him uh, in his first year? And also, if you could just elaborate maybe on Bo Prabula's uh, first season at Penn State. We didn't really get to see him. Uh, a lot of people have, have in their minds have Drew as, as the heir apparent to Sean. So what have the conversations been like with you uh, and Bo Prabula as he kind of moves forward? Well, first, Drew. Um, Drew was the one thing that really stood out to me was his uh, competitiveness. You know, as a true freshman coming in 
and uh, having a significant impact on us up front and playing as much as he did. Um, he didn't bat an eye, and he stuck his nose in there and got better and competed his butt off. So he's going to be a great player for us moving forward, so really excited about him. Um, Bo is an unbelievable quarterback um, and person, and his inner drive, that competitiveness, is you know as good as I've ever been around. It's 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 impressive. He is an awesome kid to be around. Um, he takes care of his business. Um, he's going to continue to compete, and that's really been the message: is just put your head down and compete, and that's what he's done. And with continued opportunities, you know he's going to continue to impress us. He, he's he's going to seize the moment. He's just gritty. Um, he's talented. Um, he could do a lot of different things for your offense. Uh, he's a very dynamic quarterback, and, and I'm excited about him in the future of this program. Good. Mike, I, I imagine at the end of the day, you want your starting quarterback to be good at everything, but the presence of a running game when it comes to the timeline of how you want your next starting quarterback to prepare and, and how you pick and choose what you work on next, does that impact development at all when you know that maybe there's a difference between Drew or Bo have to lean, they have to be the guy versus, you know, they've got some guys behind them that can carry that load? That's a great question. I think you have to play to the quarterback strengths, you know, um, so you want them playing at a very confident level. So therefore, if they throw on the run, well, you better have some plays where you're throwing on the run. If they're a, a dynamic dual threat, you better have some zone read or power read or whatever your plan is from a run game standpoint to take advantage of your, your personnel strengths. And, you know, to, you know, to really try to outthink yourself in that regard, I think what you want to try to do is put the best product on the field, period, and play to the quarterback's strengths. You know, that's at the end of the day what you have to do. And then complement everything around that, right? And, and to help those quarterbacks. There's still going to be both two young quarterbacks next year, right, with limited experience. So we need to make sure that uh, with our backfield, we have some direct tailback runs that we're handing the ball off to our tailbacks and coming downhill with a physical uh, demeanor and attitude and establish that toughness and that ground game and just come straight downhill at people and then have the play action passes off that. And then there's a lot of dynamic plays that, that you want to incorporate because they take advantage of space and put defenders in conflict with whether it be RPOs or whether it be some quarterback zone runs, which they both can do. So we have a good problem. And uh, all of those things are part of it. And at the same time, you have to play to your personnel strengths, both at quarterback and tailback and receiver and tight end. So those are all the things that come into it. And then at the same time, you don't want to be so spread out that you really don't have an identity, right? So that's, that's going to be really important for us moving forward to have a plan um, as far as, as that's concerned and, and to uh, have that toughness and grit in your run game um, that, that we want to hang our hat on. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, guys. It's about every head coaching job that opens up. I'm sure that's flattering, uh, but can you talk about what your plans are for next season at this point, and how do you deal with those questions when recruits ask them? It's one thing if I ask, it's another thing when a recruit asks. Thanks. Well, this is just time of year. is silly season, and it's called silly season for a reason because a lot of it is just noise, rumors. Um, stuff that can be put out actually by other schools. Um, the great thing I have is I've got a great job, and uh, it would take an amazingly great job to leave a great job. And uh, so you focus on what's real. You focus on whether that's and – that, and this is not the first time through this, right? So this is kind of how you handle it. You're, you're in, you're out. Um, and in this profession, you know, they're – you know, if you're doing a good job, they're saying you're leaving somewhere else. If you're not doing a good job, they say they want you to leave and go somewhere else. It's just the nature of the business. So you just you manage to, uh, like I said, keep keep real what's real and and press on. Rich, Manny, I'd like to ask you about two linebackers. Um, when you first saw Abdul Carter, did you expect the kind of season that he's had as a freshman? And secondly, can you assess and evaluate Don DeLuca and his progress this year? Thanks. Yeah, yeah you can't. Well, it's funny. I got, you know, about this time last year, this might have been signing day last year. Sunday was a week earlier, a year ago. 
And remember one of the first things I did was watch all the, the incoming, you know, commits, including Abdul. And, you know, his, his production and his explosiveness, it jumped off the tape, the things that you saw this year. But you can't predict um, how a guy's going to come in and have the maturity to, to learn it, um, you know, A, just mentally, but B, just the day-to-day -day and, and, and the, the intensity and the urgency it takes to really be a guy. Um, there were signs in training camp. You know, there was, a, there was a week where, you know, I think Curtis Jacobs was down for a couple of days just with a typical training camp type thing, and Abdul ran with the ones and, and, and didn't look out of place. And, and again, I don't mean physically, but just in terms of being able to handle his job. And the biggest thing, I'm just proud of the way that he developed through the course of the year. I mean, certainly he made some flash plays early on, like at Auburn, um, but, but there's a difference between flashing and being a real guy down after down. Um, and I think really the second half of the season, you know, I thought he got better and better, helped us as a defense get better and better. Um, the trick now is that, you know, obsession with improvement can't stop um, because he played well for a freshman. For, and that's, you know, next year playing well for a freshman will not be enough um, in year two. So that'll be his challenge. And this bowl will be a bridge to that like it is for a lot of our guys. I think Dom DeLuke is a guy that is um, – um, I think when you look at the entire season, you know, he's one of those guys that can come off, must come off as an unsung hero. Uh, his role to this football team on special teams um, has been fantastic. And then what he does for us on defense, he's just a guy, you know, we, we're, we're very deep. Uh, defensively, we're very deep. We're very deep at linebacker. And, um, and certainly when we started playing Curtis and, and, and Abdul together, um, you know, getting guys like Dom on the field and Sutherland on the field, and we have so many guys that can contribute. And Dom just goes there and just makes plays, just makes things happen. He's tough. He's smart. Um, he's got a nose for the football. Um, you know, had a big breakup in the in fourth down against Michigan State. Goes in against uh, Rutgers. I think his first play might have had a tackle for loss. The second play, he forces the fumble that Kobe runs back for touchdown. So he's just one of those guys that makes things happen. Proud of. You know, we talked about it. Uh, I guess after the season, if you look at what his role was in the '21 team. Um, you know, he sort of advanced the ball onto that and what he did in 22, and, and now that'll be his goal to, you know, to find a way to craft a bigger role on the team going into 23. Corey, kind of all related here, do you want to be a head coach again? Do you think silly season is maybe over for you now this time through? It's December 16th already, and, and do you plan, is your expectation to be back here next year? Yeah, I don't think about those type of things. When you mention, you know, silly season, at this point it's, it's, you know, full speed ahead for, for 2023. Well, first of all, for the Rose Bowl, right? Um, uh, in terms of ambition, yeah, I'd like to be head coach again. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think there's some unfinished business with the way things happened a year ago, which I think it's kind of played out. Um, but I think second time around, I think you're a little wiser in the opportunity. Um, and I don't think you don't necessarily just let the opportunity choose you. I think you choose the opportunity a little bit differently. Um, and so it, all of that, like I said, it, it's when you don't have a platform that you feel comfortable at where you're at, um, you may feel more desperate to, to just to just lunge for something. Uh, so that's where I'm very blessed that I've got a place where um, where I know we can play great defense for a long time. And that's a standard. And, and, it, and it, it gets you into the office every day to make sure that uh, that as a staff and then as a, as a unit that we uphold that standard. T Frank over here to the left. Manny, how are you doing today? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm good. I want to ask, you've talked about this already uh, here today, but playing Abdul and Curtis at the same time and making that shift in the middle of the season, how do you balance best player on the field, but also what we know about or what we were told about the structure of your defense and wanting more of a, a safety-like player at that SAM position, knowing in the future you're going to have different players, different body types to work with as well. So how do you go about that puzzle piece when you're trying to fit everybody in? Well, I don't know if it was just specifically wanting to have a safety type body at that position. Um, there were also matchup, you know, um, issues, I, I guess, taken into play, you know, where, you know, if you're going against more 12 personnel type teams with two tight ends, you might want some bigger type bodies. It's just look when, when, you know, what any coach ought to do is when you show up, you look at the personnel that you have and then, and then our responsibility is what's the best way to deploy the players that we have. And, you know, Curtis was playing at a high level and Jonathan Sutherland was playing at a high level. But Abdul, as, as he started to grow and grow and, and, you know, it just didn't make any sense for the two of them to compete for snaps. Um, they had already been, I mean, the two of them had already been starting side by side in our third down package, I think, since Auburn. Um, so really it was now a way of being comfortable with the down, after down type thing. Kurt had experience playing at Sam, 
um, you know, from last year. So that wasn't foreign to him. He could handle that. And the two positions really in terms of, of learning are not dramatically different. So I, I, I thought a lot of credit goes to Kurt for being able to have the flexibility. It's not hard. I mean, so we really, we would rotate, you know, Kurt would get a series at Sam. Um, Southern would come in, Kurt would get a series at Will. So really you had, you had three guys that could roll in between those two spots. And that's to say nothing of guys like, again, DeLuca, Catcher, who all contributed well for us when they got their chances here as well. We'll go to Ben. Many over here. Um, People say over here, and that doesn't really help. I'm on your right. <laughs> it's a voice of God. There you go. Where am yeah. I? I'm right here. Yes. Um, as a defensive-minded guy, you know, there's lots of places in this day and age where defenses just hang on for dear life and hope that you score enough points to win. To be at a program that has hung its hat on historically and in present day on defense, does that bring an extra level of um, satisfaction? And the, the other part of that, while we're talking about your general happiness, um, What's your relationship with the snow these days? Because I remember your that first video of you walking down the tunnel and you had a very what have I done sort of happy and yet oh my god it's cold sort of face. Really, that is that is quite a quite a diagnosis. You know what I mean? The, the happy and what have I done face. Uh, it had been a long twenty four hours. Do you charge by the hour? You know, kind of. Do you have a, do you have a couch? Um, <laughs> so let's start with the first question again. The first question was. Uh, being at a defensive mind. Yes, OK. Defense. Well, I think, it, ironically, somewhere around that time walking out that tunnel, I also sat here in front of most of you all and, and talked about why Penn State. And, um, and part of what attracted me here was, one, the tradition of playing defense at the school. And then second, you know, with Coach Franklin, I sat here a year ago, and we talked about the Penn State defense. What, it, what a Penn State defense is, and not about me or any other coach or whatever. Um, that there was something going on culturally here that contributed to us having the ability to play elite level defense. And we flirted with that at times this year. I think that's kind of what, um, there's a taste in our mouth that we, we want more of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that exists. Now, the great thing with, with, with the way that our team is structured is that there's gonna be games where you have to rely on the offense. There's gonna be games where you have to rely on defense. It's good team ball. It's about playing good complimentary football, which you hear all the time. But, um, but I, I'm, I'm fortunate because of the players that I get to coach. And I think that's been the most rewarding thing of the last 12 months from when I sat in here a year ago is really to getting to know our players, whether it was starting off at the bowl practice a year ago where I'm just kind of a fly on the wall, um, and then going through winter workouts, going through spring practice. But you really don't really get to know people until you go through the season. When you really the submarine dives down, you really get into it, and it's intensive, and you're there every day. Um, and seeing the way that these guys go, the way that these guys grind, the work, and then you know, it's so funny, and you, you all know this in college football because it's such a narrative-based sport, but we reserve the right to improve as a defense. You know, and that's something that it's so easy to make a judgment in this sport. And if you look at the way that we played in the Michigan game, for example, like, oh, well, you know, we stink, or we're, you know, Barry, Penn State, whatever. And those guys, they hear all that stuff. And our ability to come in and to be honest with ourselves in terms of, you know, not just how we played, but why we played the way that we played that day, and to get better from that moment. And coming in here against an outstanding rushing attack in Minnesota the following week, and how we played that game, how we played against Ohio State, and how we played up front against those guys the following week, and then that carried us into November. We became a much more confident team. Um, and that's just because, and that's why I say the credit goes to the players because they said, you know what, despite what people say about us and, and, and this narrative and, and trying to, no, no, you know what, we can just improve. Um, and now we need to because Utah is a um, as tough a football team as anybody we've played on our schedule this year, counting Michigan. Um, and and their belief and their ability to pound the football um, will be difficult to stop. I don't I don't mean stopping the the pounding the football. I mean stopping their belief. You can tell they're so confident in it because they've got 12 weeks of evidence, including what they did to Ohio State in the Rose Bowl a year ago, um, that they can you know they can you know you know put a hat on everybody and just kind of maul you up front. So. Uh, so a great challenge. Um, the snow part, I I'm enjoying that. You know what I mean? So it was a little fun you know, flying into town last night at, at about 1230 at night. And um, you know, cheers, cheers to the people who handle the roads around here to make sure that I didn't end up in a ditch. And uh, that's just going to be our plan. We're just gonna try as long as we stay out of a ditch, we're going to be OK. That's what's kind of on a ditch by ditch basis. So <laughs> Mike, go ahead. Mandy, you mentioned Michigan and Ohio State. You have a unique position that you've played two of the four teams in the playoffs. What does Penn State have to do 
to get in that position to be one of those four teams? Well, I think what our players understand right now is that, you know, that it's a great question, and it feels like a broad question. Like there's these grandiose things that we have to do, um, and I don't think the players in our locker room see it that way. Um, and I think you know now, as a little bit of time has gone through those games, um, I think we were learning. You know, I think there's, and I think that's what teams were allowed to do. Um, you know, you hear coaches say this all the time. It doesn't mean it's not true. You know, that losses can become lessons. Um, and I think we learned a lot from both of those games. You know, and even just talking to the players here, even though obviously I'm, you know, I was not here last fall. I mean, if you look at Michigan, if you look at where Michigan was when they walked out of State College in 2021, you know, two teams that were probably mirror images of each other. And then their belief, what happened here in, in beating Ohio State in Ann Arbor a year ago and then what and how they've kicked on from that. Um, you know, oftentimes that's just what it takes. It, it may just take a, a, a moment you know, where a thing happens in the course of the game that, that creates that belief. Belief is a very, very powerful thing. So um, I think our players see that. I don't think they feel the um, proverbial gap is quite as big, but it doesn't matter. We all start again zero and zero a year ago, and, and uh, we know that we've got in our league, in our conference, which is the great thing about being in our league, is we've got a very, very high standard that we have to live up to. And, um, and that's gotta be, uh, so, I mean, I mean, it goes into this bowl practice. I mean, that, that's, that's what this, we're practicing tonight for that standard. I mean, we come back for winter workouts for that standard. And I, th I think our players want that. I think, I think they're encouraged by that. All right, thank you very much, Manny. We will have players in about one minute here. Thank you all.